Welcome back everyone. In this lecture, we're gonna talk about summation notation. Now, for most of us growing up, when we took our math courses, we learned addition, subtraction, multiplication, division, algebra, and even a lot of, uh, a lot of us learned um, higher levels of math. Um, one of the things that, that is unique to statistics is how the formulas are often presented. So the math in and of itself isn't all that advanced. It's just that sometimes we see certain symbols in statistical formulas that we're not always used to. Um, and this sort of like the category of the types of symbols and the types of formula is known as summation notation. So in this short lecture, I wanna go over and just do a quick review of how to understand and approach um, mathematical equations that are in this summation notation format so that you're not overly intimidated and that you can walk through it and be able to solve problems um, in a relatively easy manner. So in this lecture, we're gonna start off with introducing you to some of the common symbols that we see in summation notation. Um, let's also do a quick uh, review of the mathematical order of operations. Um, and then I'm gonna jump right in and give you a small data set as an example, um, a few sort of practice formulas, and then we're gonna walk through solving those particular examples. So let's go ahead and get started. So on this slide, what we're seeing here is in red along the left-hand side are the various symbols that are typically um, or that are typically going to pop up when you're looking at mathematical formulas that are written in this summation notation format. So let's kind of go through each one of these, um, give a brief example, and then you'll see them sort of illustrated when we get to the examples on the following slides. So arguably the first um, and most important symbol we're going to see is the sigma sign, that, that capital Greek letter sigma. Um, this is known as the summation sign. So what does that mean? When you see this sigma within one, a mathematical formula, what it's telling you to do is to solve the mathematical problem that happens to follow it for all observations of the variable or variables, if there's multiple ones included. And then once you solve the mathematical problem for each of those observations, you sum or add up the answers. So we'll see that illustrated in a few moments. So that's the key thing that we kind of, that sort of defines this thing called summation notation. The second thing that we often see, and usually this is written sort of as a subscript or sort of as like a small little character next to um, a variable or something that, that of that nature is I. And we've seen I in a couple of our previous lectures when we saw how data may be presented to us. I is just that case counter, right? So it it's a placeholder for person one, person two, person three, et cetera. Then another symbol we should make sure that we're comfortable with is that lowercase letter N. N simply means if you see this in a mathematical formula, it simply means insert the sample size for the data that you're working with. Um, then variables, typically things towards the end of the alphabet, such as X, Y, and Z, are simply placeholders to represent different variables, variable X, variable Y, variable Z, and so forth. And then finally, as far as symbols, you'll see where we have that little X sub I. So this is, in, this is incorporating both variable X as well as the case counter I. So when we see this in a formula, it's basically telling us you should insert the value of variable X for case I in the data. So when we put this all together, when we see that sigma sign before a mathematical formula, and then we see something like an X I in there, what it's telling us to do is put the value of variable X for person number one into the formula, solve the formula, get an answer. Then move on to person number two insert the value of variable X for person number two, solve the formula, get an answer, hold on to it. And you do that for each of the observations in the data. Once you have all of your answers for person one, person two, person three, et cetera, you add or sum up all of those to get your final answer. And that in a nutshell is how summation notation works. The final thing I have on this slide down at the bottom is PEMDAS, P-E-M-D-A-S. Now, this is also something you may recall from uh, growing up and learning math at various stages. This is the mathematical order of operations. And when we're trying to solve things that are in a summation notation format, 
it's really important that you remember the mathematical order of operations. So what does PEMDAS stand for? What is it telling us to do? It tells us with that P, it says take care of whatever is in parentheses first in a formula. And then the E, the next letter, then it says move on to solve any exponents that you may see. Following that, you solve for MD, any multiplication and division. And then finally, the last thing you solve for in a mathematical formula is AS, which is the addition and subtraction. So whether you remind, remember it as PEMDAS, or many of us grew up with like sayings like, please excuse my dear Aunt Sally, um, as mnemonic ways to remember it, you wanna make sure you, you're comfortable with that as you work through some of these examples. So let's go ahead and dive in and look at some examples. So on this slide, what I have is, let's start off with the chart. So the chart presents data. We have an I column. So remember, that's just our case counter representing the people or research subjects we have. So we have one, two, three, four, five um, subjects or cases in our data set. So that's what the I column is telling us. And remember that one, two, three, four, five. That also tells us our sample size. So remember N from the previous um, slide as a sample size. If we look at the I column and figure out how many cases we have, that tells us our sample size. Then we also have two variables. We have variable X and variable Y. And you'll notice here that for each of our five cases, everybody has a value for variable X and variable Y. Now, what those two variables are or what they stand for right now, we don't care. We just know that there are two variables. So that's one way of presenting the data. Now, if you look back over to the left of this um, particular slide and you see up at the top in the red and the green font, this is just another way of presenting the same data that we see in the chart on the right. Um, so sometimes depending upon a textbook or depending upon um, where you're looking at data, it may be presented in either of these fashions, but note it's the exact same thing. And so, for example, when we look over at that red um, line of numbers and, and symbols, we see X sub 1 equals 4. What this tells us is that the value of variable X for person 1 equals 4. And if you look back over to the chart on the right and you look at person 1, and then go over to their X value, sure enough, it's a four, right? And then moving on, the X for person two is a two, the X for person three equals five, and so forth. And it's the same idea with the Y variable as well. So however you see data presented to you, I just wanna make sure you're, you're comfortable with what you're looking at. Now our next step, and this is what the, the, the sort of the bulk of what we wanna get at with this lecture is, is can you use the data that is presented to you and in order to solve the eight mathematical problems that we see on the left-hand side where it says calculate the following. So the first one is sum of X. The next one is the sum of X minus two in parentheses. And then as we move on down. So what my goal is when it comes to summation notation, in order for us to solve these formulas, they're not gonna be all that difficult, but you have to have data presented to you. And that's why we start with the data. And then you have a summation notation formula as we see with examples one through eight. And then we're looking to get a single final numerical answer for each one of them. So feel free to either pause this presentation to work on them, or if you want to, you can skip ahead. But on the next several slides, I'm gonna walk through each one of these eight examples and show how we would go about solving them. So when you're ready, you can, go, you can go ahead and go to the next slide. On this slide, we take a look at examples one and two. So let's look at number one. Number one is about the simplest uh, that we can think about with summation notation. So let's go back to what we saw on the sort of the, the, the explanation uh, slide that talked about the various symbols. So question number one simply says, the sigma sign, so the sum of x sub i. So what did we? how are we supposed to interpret that? Recall from that explanation slide that whenever you see sigma, you compute an answer to the mathematical formula that follows it for each observation in the data set. So what this is telling us to do, the mathematical formula is not very advanced. It's just simply x. 
So it says, give me the value of x for person one, person two, person three, person four, and person five. Get an answer and then sum them up. And that's what we see. So we took the value of x for person one, which was a four, the value of x for person two, which was a two, the value of x for person three, which was a five, and so forth. And we get four plus two plus five plus seven plus one. And we get a final answer for that equation of 19. Moving on to number two, similar, but now we're getting a little bit more sophisticated. We actually have a legitimate mathematical formula. And you'll notice that the mathematical formula itself is encapsulated within parentheses. So it's reminding you that you need to, thinking back to PEMDAS, you need to do the entire, what is inside the parentheses for each person before you move on to the next person. So it's telling us take the value of X for person one and then subtract two, get an answer. Take the value of X for person two subtract two, get an answer. Take the value of X for person three, subtract two, get an answer, and so forth. And we see that sort of laid out in the explanation. And then as you can see, it should solve down to a value of nine. For these next two examples, three and four, really all we're doing is just adding a little bit more sophistication. But if you sort of think about it and think about PEMDAS, we walk through it in a similar manner. So in number three, what we have is the only extra layer of complexity really is, is that we have it sort of broken down where that sigma sign shows up twice. So you need to make sure you do this, the sigma, the first sigma, which is just add up all the X values, get an answer, hold on to it, and then do the second sigma, which is the X minus five, get an answer, and then merge them together to get that total of 25. In number four, we're introducing another, number one, another one of our symbols. We're introducing that N. And remember, N is the sample size, and that is the number of cases in your data set, so that was five. So, and you'll notice that the top part of that um, equation is encapsulated once again in parentheses. So it's telling us to make sure you get that answer first, the sum of all the X's before you divide by the sample size and we should end up with a 3.8. Now, one of the things I'm gonna take a quick moment to stop and remind you of in this class is when you're dealing with statistics, numbers and accuracy are extremely important. Even being off by one-tenth or one-hundredth of a point can lead you in the wrong direction. And so when you're solving things in this class, if your answer comes out to be a whole number, like we see with number three, fine, you're gonna leave it as a whole number. But if your answer comes out with decimals, such as what we see in number four, please make sure that you keep the a accurate decimal depiction of your answer. So what do I mean by that? Well, we came down to 19 over five. Do not leave your answers in an improper fraction. Um, do not turn it into a mixed number. Do not leave us with fractions. You need to get an answer that is as accurate as possible within decimal format. So in this case, 19 divided by five, you either do it in your, in your head or you enter it into your calculator. It comes out to 3.8, fine, you leave it at that. However, if you compute your answer and your answer comes out to say 3.82479, where the decimals keep going, then you need to appropriately round your answer. So never, never, never round your answer to a whole number if there are decimals. Um, ideally, when people, students will say, well, how many decimal places do you want me to round my answer to? The key thing that I say is usually like two or three is sort of like the Goldilocks zone, the perfect zone. But for the sake of this class, is you can round anywhere between one and four decimal places. So you can go out like 3.8 to the tenths place. But if, if your numbers go further, you can go out to the hundredths or the thousands or the ten thousandths place. Um, but the key thing is make sure you round accurately. And remember from prior math classes, remember if there are numbers that continue out in that decimal format, you always have to look at the number that's one to the right of where you plan to round. And if the value is zero through four, 
you keep your number where it is, your decimal point where it is. If the value for that value that is one to the right is five or greater, you need to round up and you need to bump up your sort of stopping point number. Now, I'm hoping most for most of you, you're going like, oh yes, I remember that from school. If you, it's been a while and you're uncomfortable with the proper way to round um, decimal points, then send me an email, let me know, and I'll provide you with some examples. All right, let's go ahead and move on. So for questions five and six, this is also an example. Pretty much you'll notice a lot of the same material is showing up here for equation five and equation six, but the key thing is the location of the parentheses as well as the exponent. And the exponent is that squared, that, that um, superscript two that we see in each of these formulas. In question five, note that the parentheses are outside of the entire equation. So it says, take care of X squared for each value before you move on. And that's exactly what we see when we look at how it's calculated, which leads us to four squared plus two squared plus five squared, et cetera, which gives us a total value of 95. In number six, on the other hand, you'll notice that now the square, the exponent is outside of the parentheses. So PEMDAS tells us take care of what's inside the parentheses first before you move on to the exponent. So we need to take care of the sum of X, get an answer and then square that answer. And that's what we see here where we get the add up all the X values, get a 19, we square it and we end up with 361. Now, finally, we have questions seven and eight. And here, these also introduce a couple new components, um, but hopefully not getting too hard for any of us and hopefully something that we can understand pretty easily. So seven and eight, the two things that we notice here is one is that we're moving around the parentheses once again. Um, we also have that asterisk. Now that asterisk, um, you may recall from other classes, is simply a, represents a multiplication sign. Right, so rather than typing in an X into the formula, when we also have a variable X, I don't wanna allow for any confusion or lead to any confusion. So whenever you see that asterisk, that is just indicative of multiplication. The other thing that we have introduced in these ones is we're also introducing our second variable, variable Y. So the same logic goes is as that we've been working with through the rest of them applies here. So looking at number seven, Notice that within parentheses, it says X times Y. So we do the same logic. We start with person one, insert their value of X and their value of Y, get an answer. Move on to person two, insert their value of X, their value of Y, get an answer, and so forth. And then once we add them up, we get a total of 64. In number eight, we're also working with both X and Y, but now we've got the parentheses breaking this apart into sort of two different equations that we need to handle prior to multiplying the answers together. So the first one is just summing up all the X values, four, two, five, seven, and one. The second part is summing up all the Y values, five, three, four, two, and four. Get an answer for each one of those and then move on down the line of PEMDAS to multiplication and multiply 19 times 18 and we end up with an answer of 342. Okay, so this has been a brief introduction to summation notation and how we might start to see it um, in the realm of statistics. And I will be introducing various formulas to you and as well as your book, we'll be showing examples of formulas using this format. And hopefully this gives you a little better understanding and comfort level uh, when facing these types of formulas. As far as what will be expected of you, if you can handle and understand these eight examples that we had in this PowerPoint presentation, you'll be just fine as, as well as, as far as being able to understand summation notation for this course. All right, and that's all I have for this one, so take care.